publicly. <laughs> well, they're afraid of being criticized and thought to be, you know, um, in La La Land, and, and of course it could affect their, their position in their job or whatever. I went to the post office and the next day and I saw the RCMP there and I told him, I said, well, I saw that big UFO that flew over yesterday, last night, and he said, that was no UFO, that was a meteor breaking up. And I said, well, I hope to heck it, you're right, because if you're not, there was somebody behind the wheel driving it. The reasons why witnesses and government agencies do not come forward publicly are many. The RCMP, Transport Canada, Yukon Municipal and First Nation governments were all invited to the conference in 2000, but for various reasons did not attend. A letter from the Department of National Defence states that they couldn't attend because of scheduling conflicts. Louise Hardy was Yukon's Member of Parliament from 1997 to 2000. She provided some opening remarks at the 2000 UFO conference. We know that there is a, a wider world out there and I see this work as, as people coming together to investigate and study that wider world. So I hope everybody enjoys the conference and, and, I, and I hope that you know that you're on the cutting edge here. There's not too many places that have UFO conferences, so congratulations. Louise Hardy was one government official to whom the 1996 sighting was reported by the Yukon UFO Research Society. I sent it to just about anybody I could. Uh, Louise Hardy, our, our MP at the time, um, the RCMP detachment in Whitehorse, uh, DND out of Yellowknife, and uh, a lot of the communities as well. And uh, basically what what I ask is to uh, for two-way exchange of information about this case. We did eventually get a response about a year later from the National Defense and, and they forwarded the report to a UFO organization in Manitoba which is kind of like the central collecting uh, point of, for UFO sightings and but they're just like uh, another organization like us so it actually went Full, the report went full circle and uh, there was really no official acknowledgement. This email sent to Martin Jasek from a Canadian Forces Intelligence and Security Officer dated August 8, 2000, states in part, Canada and the USA as NORAD partners back in either the end of the 1970s or the early 1980s determined that the existence of extraterrestrials was unfounded. The email goes on to say, it has been my experience that all sightings that I have reported up the chain of command have proven to be either satellites or high-flying military aircraft. The long-standing theory of a government cover-up is also a concern to witnesses and investigators. No one talks about it because the governments don't uh, acknowledge the fact that these things exist. There was a news story about this particular UFO um, on the radio the next morning but that's all it was, like uh, people seen this. There's no, nothing that says uh, whether any um, uh, airports had it on their radar screen or what it was or, you know, there's no answers, absolutely no answers. So the government is kind of like our, they like to think of themselves as being our parents, assuring us that everything's okay, um, everything's under control, they have everything under control and, and to admit to this would indicate that they don't have everything under control and uh, um, then there's the issue of uh, fear that uh, everybody will panic and um, um, there's also things like um, issue of energy, if people, if this becomes accepted then what energy are these UFOs using to fly around at such great speeds Convincing government agencies and officials, scientists and the general public to take the UFO phenomena seriously and to accept it as a legitimate field of study was a long-term goal of the UFO conference in Whitehorse, Yukon in 2000. A shorter-term goal was to begin establishing an environment of trust, respect and cooperation between witnesses, civilian investigators and government agencies. Martin Jasek, the main investigator of the giant UFO that was witnessed in 1996, would like to see some frank and open discussion take place. Yeah, my hopes are that we'll be able to get to that stage and talk about it, and then once it's accepted, then you can really put the resources on it to find out what, what's going on. Like, it, it's 
people working out of their homes trying to solve the mysteries and answer these questions, it, it, it just can't be done. But witnesses still want answers. Not just the witnesses that sighted the giant object in 1996, but others in Yukon whose experiences have gone far beyond just a sighting. Colette Opper was a participant at the conference in 2000. I, I didn't see any beings. I knew there was beings there. I didn't see what they looked like. It was a very odd feeling because what I saw in front of me was something that went straight out in front and I can look up, but that's it. Um, to me it looked metal, but the only thing that didn't make any sense to me, how could that be happening on the side of my head? I really f find that the UFO sightings follow along family lines and um, uh, certain people, certain people uh, can see them uh, have sightings more often and uh, I'm not sure what it is, uh, First Nations in particular stand out. From what I understand, if you have one incident, you have many incidents and if uh, sometimes that just is, follows along in your family. Do certain cultures seem more open to such phenomenon as Martin Jassick and Lorraine Bretland believe? And are Aboriginal people more susceptible to such events? Or could the UFO phenomena already be incorporated into Aboriginal oral histories? Another event that needed to be recorded. One of the oldest stories involving celestial phenomenon can be found in neighboring British Columbia. Elder Chief Kenneth Harris translates in the book, Visitors Who Never Left, the origins of the people of Dom Lahamid, a place that existed between the Skeena and Nass rivers in northern BC thousands of years ago. The story tells of a young woman who was taken to a house in the sky by a strange visitor. This is where the old lady started to shout looking for a husband for her granddaughter. That's where her name was born, Timenskawak. Suddenly one day a fog settled in where they were on top of the mountain and out steps a young man and the old lady knew that this man was different. He has to be from heaven, you know, an angel. And he only took the girl with, uh, with him. And it turned out to be that this girl is our first mother in heaven. You see? And, uh, and the person that came to pick her up was an angel also. And so this is the beginning of our creation in, in heaven. Simlaha. In heaven, the girl is taken to what is described as a house. In the corner of the house is something that resembles dripping water. A baby placed under the drips could grow into adulthood in an incredibly short period of time. He had a little drips of water from the corner of the house. And what happened, this girl, although they never lived together, and the young man that brought her there had a child. The first child was born. He took the child and brought it to his father, who was sitting in the middle of the house. And what he did, he washed the baby in the little jigs that uh, flew from the corner of his house and all of a sudden the little baby grew to be a man and uh, and that was the beginning this became the first born son of Kyom we call him Kyom the next child became was a, was a boy and became a man and now the third one was a little girl and so the, the three children are growing up they, well they didn't grow up he stretched them 
stretch them into adult adulthood.